Anthony, such a pleasure to be um, here with you this morning. I was telling you earlier before we got on, so I have the privilege and pleasure to do so many of these panels for Center for Communications. And I was, I sort of jumped up when Max said, um, oh, Anthony Sparks is joining us. I'm like, oh, that's me. I'm sorry, there's a motion sensor thing happening here. <laughs> so um, I'm a huge fan of your work and well, so grateful you. for what you're doing and, and absolutely love Queen Sugar, both for its incredible creative prowess, but for its political existence and, and what it says yeah. to all of us as people of color yeah. um, working in this business that, hey, there's a place for us. And I greatly Absolutely. appreciate the space that you've carved out and, and how beautifully you've done it and um, look forward to, to talking with you. Excellent. No, thank you so much to the Center um, you know, for Communication for having me, uh, for this opportunity to talk with you, Ray, and talk uh, with, um, uh, with the attendees today. Um, you know, uh, this really professionally has become uh, my career in arts and entertainment and in mass media and television in particular has really become, um, uh, you know, my life's work from a professional standpoint. Um, and it is one, uh, a challenge uh, and a joy that I take on, you know, very, very happily. Um, it is uh, not always an easy career. Uh, to enter, to sustain, and to grow in, but it is uh, worth it, particularly if you feel like um, you have a purpose to what you want to do. And so Queen Sugar, for me, has been uh, very much uh, a, a sort of a convergence of all of those things. And so I'm, I'm very happy to be here and share whatever I can, and hopefully people will get up something out of it. <laughs> yeah, well, absolutely. And uh, we're going to, because I'm a Queen Sugar nerd, we're going to have to talk about the characters a little later in the conversation. Absolutely. <laughs> but um, <laughs> but to, to kind of kick us off, I know we have a lot of incredible young people who are, who are just getting into the business and who might be having their first jobs or looking for their first jobs. And I'm right. one of the things that I, I love to uh, remind people of is that the, the business that we're in, you know, there's no straight line in terms of our, our career journey, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> Very far from it. Uh, so I, I, I asked the question, it's a big question, but you know, to think about where you started and to give us a little bit of an outline of you know, where your, your journey in this business began. And Absolutely. You know, I'll, I'll poke in with some questions, but would love to just kind of hear, hear a bit of that story. Yeah, and if I leave anything out or anything you want me to address further, please just jump right in. I think for me, I got to start at the beginning. And for me, that means, I look, I am a kid from the south side of Chicago, proudly. Um, and I did not, you know, I'm not old, but I am in my 40s. And so when I was growing up, you know, there are things that are now in the popular lexicon of our culture. People have heard the term showrunner. They've heard the term executive producer. They've heard those things. Uh, you know, growing up, when I was growing up, that was not the case. There weren't really a lot of books. You didn't read trays. There was no websites and stuff to read. And so one of the things I do want to say to your your your, your students uh, or the students that are listening to this is that they are living in a great time to get information. <laughs> like, you can get information. Yes, absolutely. That's <laughs> so know. true. So... Part of my journey was just learning that these things even existed. I couldn't dream when I was in high school of being a television showrunner, executive producer, because I didn't know that such a thing existed. Right. But I could dream. I was a creative kid. Um, you know, I did well in school, but I was also very creative. And I'm very thankful to my family, um, who uh, probably up until that time had never quite seen a kid like me, <laughs> uh, for not squashing that and for encouraging my creativity. Uh, but so I could imagine being an actor, though. And so um, because I was doing theater at my church and community centers and in my middle and high school, and that became the space where I really could express myself and 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 was having people tell me, hey, you're good at this. You're good at this. You're good at this. So I started out as an actor. I went to USC, um, University of Southern Cal, um, uh, to their theater school, which is a top undergraduate theater school. And I was in their VFA program. And at that time, the tr actor training there was very, very text-based. And so I was also just reading tons of incredible 
dramatic literature plays at that time and just sort of getting on fire about that. But I also used to hang out at the cinema school a little bit. And back then when we had like billboards, actual real billboards, I remember seeing things like the Warner Brothers Television Writers Workshop Program, uh, the ABC Disney Television Writers uh, Fellowship, you know, things like that. And I sort of realized that while I wanted to begin as an actor, I already had it in the back of my head that I would need to grow into another aspect of the business at some point um, because I wanted to have a little bit more um, control is the wrong word, but a little bit more of an input before the acting part of the business kicks in, which is often rightly or wrongly, the last part of a project to come together, unless you're a superstar or something like that, and the project starts with you. So anyway, long story short, so as an actor, I moved to New York. I was in a show called Stomp for five years. I was doing regional oh, theater. Oh, wait, you were in Stomp? I was in Stomp. That's Amazing. Right. <laughs> yeah. do, you know, do you know Miles? Yeah, Miles Crawford. Yes, oh yeah. my, gosh, um, my closest friend. Look at oh, that. Oh, Miles see? is such an awesome, awesome dude. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Miles. What a and, great place to start. So much creativity. Oh my God. It was a bunch of all of these like kind of like artsy fartsy sort of left of center weird people who yep. fit this show. And I was one of those, one of those, those performers and, Love it. you know, and really, and in fact, I sometimes call stop my first writing job. And the Ooh. reason I call it that is because I played sort of the, the, the sort of cast jester, so to speak, you know, so I was a guy who would, a cast member who would ding when everybody else would dong, who always went against the grain. Okay. And I had certain punchlines I had to hit every night, but my directors of the show began to trust me and they let me sort of create my, improvise my way to those punchlines. As long as I hit Amazing. those punchlines. So I literally, I must have done, you know, 500 to a thousand stomp shows in my wow. career. And I don't, I never did a show that was, the same. Oh, I love so, that show. So I totally, so I sometimes like call that my first writing job. While I was Very there, cool. I started writing plays while I was in New York. Um, and, uh, and so from, and I was starting to write plays because I was being told when I was auditioning for TV and film, I was being told that there was not really space for somebody like me who looked mm -hmm. like me, who talked like me, who walked like me. People didn't believe I was from the South side of Chicago. Cause they're like, you don't seem like you're from the South side of Chicago. I was like, whatever that means about, you know, right. the nineties, you know? And so I began to realize that while I was making a living as an actor, I was very blessed and fortunate out of the gate to make a living as an actor. That's amazing. At 22 yeah. years old, I'm forever thankful for that. I also began to feel the possibility starting to close in on me. Mm. And I was like, I'm 25, I'm 26. <laughs> How can my opportunities be, be getting smaller? Closing, yeah. No sense, you know? Um, and so I began writing as a way to try and take that back to sort of try and mm. open up opportunities for myself right. and others. And so while I was writing plays, I then got the attention of a talent scout from NBC while I was in New York, who was like, have you ever thought about writing television? And I was like, yeah, I have. I don't know how to do it, but I actually have. And he was like, you should think about that. At that time, there were not a lot of books on how to write TV or what a TV yeah. writer was. But I literally remember being in a bookstore on the Upper East Side of New York one day. Um, and I came across a book called The Showrunners. Oh, I used cool. to, so I used to hang out. So like, like, I'm that guy, like I am like hang out in bookstores and like, like that was me, right? Me too, so, love that. After, so I do a show and then I go to the bookstore, <laughs> you know. And I was always in the TV film theater section or, you know, mm -hmm. or the African-American studies section. And so I came across this book called The Showrunners. Okay. I started flipping through this book. It's out of print now. And it basically said it's called The Showrunners, The Real Stars of Television. I was like, what is this? Oh, wow. Okay. And I started flipping through it and it was describing this job that was about writing and it was about producing and it was about running the show, being a showrunner and how that's really what television is based on. People think television is based mm. on the TV stars and to a degree, of course it is, but really it's based on the writer producers, the showrunners who yes. create the shows or they show run the shows and that these are the people that are very valued in the industry. And it, I read about a lot of the job skills and I was like, huh, I think I might 
like this is cool. <laughs> I think I'm a showrunner. <laughs> it's like, I think I, I want to become it. a showrunner. How do you become? But I love more that. than that, initially, I wanted to just write and be paid for writing. Yeah. And I also wanted to participate in the cultural conversation of what we look like what yeah. we who yeah. we are because I was tired of being told by casting directors that I did not mm. exist and I was like I mm. do exist and uh there are lots of people like me who do exist and so clearly mm. we're not making it to the screen and to the images yeah. and the stories that are being pumped out into the world so I have to be honest yep. with you and say and I used to have to be very quiet about this I don't so much now because uh, I think we're at a different moment but I began to write both from a creative space and also, I guess you would call it a political decision. And that decision yeah, was absolutely. that if you're telling me that I don't exist, then you're telling other people that they don't exist. And I want to be a part yeah. of the conversation, try and change that if at all possible and get paid for it. So that's how I sort of started. There you go. So I started writing plays. My plays got me some attention. And then I started going, okay, I got to teach myself how to write TV. So I literally backstage is stomp my old castmates will tell you i used to literally sit there backstage working on scripts nice. uh, to the point where i sometimes missed an entrance or two because i was getting <laughs> <laughs> nice they made up for it they're good at improv i was like oh maybe i should be going to go do this you know and um so anyway i applied to some tv fellowships disney walt warner brothers warner brothers was the foot which is my employer now uh, so it's a full circle moment that I became a showrunner on a Warner Brothers produced show because Warner cool. Brothers was the first uh, industry fellowship to give me some attention. Uh, I also got some attention a couple of years later from the ABC Disney fellowship. And so those I got yeah. into those programs and I literally quit Stomp, a wow. hit Broadway show. I quit yeah. the show to go take a chance and become a TV it. writer. Didn't work out right away, but I Took hung a minute. in there. <laughs> but and and but that's and I love that and thank you yeah. for sharing all of that because I think it reminds all of us that it, you know there's lots of different inflection points in our career there are moments that happen all the time and and yeah. when and it's important to sort of react to those and to trust our instincts right because mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. know objectively maybe somebody would have said no you can't quit this show and quit, right. but there right. was something inside of you that said you know what I got to do uh -huh. this. Absolutely. And I do want to add one sort of thing to that, because I don't want people to think that they should like just quit their job when they have a bad day yeah. or when they think that I'm prepared for that. Um, yeah. I, I had something to go to. It wasn't necessarily a paying job, but it was opportunity. And yeah. I knew that my time in that and in, in stop was winding down, both in terms of my ability to continue with the show and then also just, uh, you know, what I thought the next chapter for me was going to be. Yeah. So I started, right, you know, so when I left the show, I had a backpack full of scripts at that point. Yeah. I had enough professional encouragement from being finalists in industry programs, from getting into industry programs, you know, yeah. to go, I think I can take this shot. And yeah. even then, like I said, it didn't work out right away. You know, certainly about a year after that, I was like, ooh, maybe this wasn't a good idea. Yeah. But I hung in there. And then within, I got my, I, I left Stomp in 2001. Um, and I had my first TV job in 2003. In retrospect, it wasn't that long. It wasn't that long. Not yet. long at the time. Not long. <laughs> but well, I think, and I love that and, and, and appreciate you sharing those moments because it, it was similar for me is that I worked at Viacom. I grew up there. I was there for 10 years on and off. And I always knew that I wanted to be an entrepreneur. You know, the way that you found mm -hmm. the showrunner book, you were like, oh, I'm a showrunner. I didn't right. necessarily have a name for it, but I was like, I'm an entrepreneur. You know, I am, I'm a right. filmmaker. I know that. But I also always knew that I needed to start my own business and to create you know, as the, the quote says, I knew I needed to build my own table because there wasn't necessarily seats for me in the places that I thought I should be. Absolutely. And, and you know, I left Viacom, but very prepared. You know, I said to myself, I'm going to learn from all of these experiences. I worked on hundreds of kinds of shows. I, you know, I learned how to shoot and edit myself. I went around the world doing that. I did so much preparation before right. I left and started Culture House about four years ago. Oh, and those first couple years were tough, but here we are, you know, where Hang it's like, a, it's yeah. exciting because it's even, you know, where 
in a lot of our audience knows me, but we have a show coming out on Hulu and owned. We have a show at Netflix. We just showed this Beautiful. show to Disney plus. I mean, these things take time, but also it's all of that time that you spent. And then sometimes it, it starts to go really fast. Um, once you hit that inflection point, but it's because of all the work that you've put in. It's exactly and, right. And that is what, you know, I'd like to encourage young people to, to, to think about is expose yourself to all kinds of experiences, get in there, do the work, do the research. And then when that inflection point comes, like it did for you, like you're ready yeah. for it. You're exactly. Ready for it. I, I just really want to underscore what you're saying. The thing that I'm hearing in common with your story and with my story is doing the work. And yes. we live, sometimes I feel a little concerned for people who are growing up right now because we live in such an era of self-promotion you know oh yes Instagram, I'm Facebook, grateful that I didn't grow up Twitter. with that my goodness and it's like <laughs> and it's all about hey I'm a badass I'm a mm-hmm. this I'm a that it's like hold on I'm a diva I I, I woke up like this no you didn't hold on <laughs> <laughs> hold on and 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 the, tra- and, and, the, and the trap of that is is if you're so busy doing that stuff, and, and by the way, there are people who have turned those platforms into creative platforms and yes. all of that. So, you know, kudos to all those people. I acknowledge and know that, and that's how people grow their audience or their brand, if you want to embrace that term. I hate that term, but, you know, blah, blah, blah. Yes. But, um, but the, the commonality is you got to be doing your work, whatever it mm-hmm. is that you say that you are interested in doing or that you say that you want to do, what is a profession? A profession to me is something that you profess to the world that you say that you are, that you do. So you mm-hmm. should be doing that. If you're an actor, find yes. a way to act. If you're a writer, write. Like really, for real. Like if yeah. you are a producer, get with some other creative people and find a way to be the thing that makes that thing come to life and be a producer. Yeah. Yeah. If If you, and this is while you're working, you know, in many ways in communication and media, many of those jobs are going to start off as assistant jobs, right? Yeah. Um, Which are huge opportunities to learn and grow. So, but then you have the weekends and you have after work, you know, if you're a creative person. You got your five to nine. Absolutely. So for me, believe it or not, at a certain point, even though I'm in a Broadway show, Stomp, Stomp after a while became my day job in a very, yeah. but that happened at night. I called it my nighttime day job after a while because right. I was blessed to be in a situation where I was in a hit show that wasn't going to close. Right. And so I could, I, so I was like, and I, so I took advantage of my youth. So the part I left out about me writing plays is in Stomp, I would do seven to eight shows a week because the show was so grueling. We would usually do seven. I would have one show off. The one show I had off, I was putting up my own show and another theater in New oh, York. Oh, wow. It was, I, I had so much Anthony, energy. Anthony, god even damn. It. I get tired just <laughs> thinking about it. It was like, yeah. so I would literally, I literally would have seven stop shows, have one show off. It's like so on, on Saturday nights, we would have shows at seven o'clock and 10 o'clock at that time and stop. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. If I had the, I would ask for the seven o'clock show off so that I could do my show in a theater off, off Broadway do my show from seven to eight 30 or nine, and then run across town to the theater to make call time for my show at 10, 10 or 10 30. Like that was the sort of thing I was doing. You can do that when you're 25. Yeah. I'll never do that when you're 45, but you can do that when you're 25 and you're committed to what you want to do. And so that was how eventually by me being both in stomp and putting my own work out there at that time, doing solo shows and plays, was how eventually that inflection point happened. And somebody said, hey, I see what you're doing. Why don't you come over here? And eventually NBC uh, had a showcase at that time and they put me in their showcase. And I didn't get a job right away, but it did tell me that I was going in the right direction. I love that. That's amazing. And, And thank you for sharing that. That's such a wonderful part of your story and inspiring because that hustle is very real, you know? And I, Mm -hmm. and it it looks different in all of our lives. And I think that, um, it's, it's important to remind all of us that it's hard work. It is hard work work. and it is work. work. And, and being in the creative industry, I think a lot of times, you know, we face this right where other people feel like, well, you know, anyone can kind of do that. Like what, 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 and it's like that, what are you, you have no idea 
You see, like, I'm laughing with exactly. Like the thing, <laughs> and, and that's why, and this is something that, you know, as I remind people too, I'm like, when people all say, oh, tell me and, and lead to my next question. It's like, describe your job to me. I'm like, without using an expletive right now, it's like, I can't, I, I cannot explain to you what I do. I mean, it's just, it is, yeah. It is the product of our experiences, what we've learned. And of course, there's the physicality of the work as a producer, but there's so much to it that's just based on informing yourself, educating yourself, being involved in all different kinds of productions, learning how to work with different kinds of people and to really harness a creative process. There's yeah. no one way to do that. And you know, way. when you're in your young and getting into the industry, what I learned the most from, and I can't say it enough, is just being in a lot of different environments with different kinds of producers, different kinds of directors, and yes. learning how they were all harnessing that creative process and, you know, operationalizing it and professionalizing it. And then you'll pick and choose what works for you. And you'll As build you get more yours. information, right. Exactly. You, because you don't know about what the jobs are really. So you become part of that process, exactly. you know, in television writing and producing and show running, it really is a quote unquote master apprentice business. You know, yeah. it is a job that you need to have a certain amount of skill and passion to get to that entry point. And then it's a learn as you go sort yes. of job. And I would love to hear you talk about that a little bit. Yeah. If, you know, you said you had this book, the, the showrunner's book, and I think we've all heard the term showrunner, but I think a lot of young people would love to hear what does that actually tactically mean for you? I yeah, mean, no what, is so many, what is a showrunner? What do you right. do on the show? Yeah, I'm, thank you, you for contribute? Yeah, thank you for asking that, because I think that there is a huge misconception among a lot of people, again, because of this media environment that we live in, social media environment. Um, the term is thrown around. I always frankly get concerned when I hear if I'm talking to people like writers and I'm like, so what do you want to be? And they say a showrunner. And I'm like, what? And I'll say, what is that? And, mm -hmm. and there's usually a big pause, because what they're thinking of is Shonda Rhimes or Damon Lindelof on the cover of a magazine. Right, right, right. <laughs> okay. That's nice, yes. And that's cool. Gotta and it love can, Shonda. And it can, it, gotta love Shonda, you know. Um, and it can lead to that kind of pop culture uh, recognition. It can. Yeah, but for sure. the most part, it doesn't. For the most part, if there are, what, 400 <laughs> scripted shows in television right now, there are about 400 showrunners, okay? So it's yeah. a very small group of people who are in charge of what you and I see in wow. scripted television. It's yeah. a huge job, a huge responsibility, and has to be treated as such. And generally, these people are writers, TV writers, who have risen through the ranks to get to what is essentially a management and a vision position. So uh, that's the showrunner. So the showrunner is generally the head writer of a TV show. And uh, usually you have executive producer partners. And so you are also an executive producer. You could be the executive producer or you could be one of a few. But at the end of the day, the showrunner is the person that if they don't do their work, there's no show. <laughs> Basically, and your job primarily is to create scripts, create stories, create worlds. And as a part of that, when you're producing that, then, you know, you are casting, you are editing, you are uh, talking to your, um, your heads of departments in terms of costumes. You are basically the keeper of the flame of that show. If you didn't create the show, like yeah. uh, uh, our show, Queen Sugar, I did not create that show. Ava DuVernay created that show. But then I have been entrusted with being sort of the creative engine of that show and being yeah. the keeper of the flame of that show because she has several shows. And so she sort of exists in a slightly different space. But I am the person who is running that show. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And so it's, but it starts with writers in the writer's room and it yes. starts there and then it grows and out. And how many writers do you typically have in your writer's room? Just to, cause I think yeah. painting the picture for, for some of our audience to understand. Okay, we've all heard the term writer's room. Okay, right. tell, us, tell us about your writer's room. What is that? Right, right. so because television is, is, a, um, is an enterprise that has a lot of money involved, Okay. Um, 
is a lot of money on the line. You know, every episode has a budget of several million dollars, okay, that have to have to be blah, blah, blah. And television is shot quickly. So it's a lot of pressure. <laughs> and you have to write anywhere from eight to 22 scripts per season. And you got to do it quickly. And you got to do it with quality. And so you're writing and you're shooting the show, generally speaking, if you're on a network model at the same time. If you're mm -hmm. working in the cable space, you might write first and then, uh, and then go shoot, but there's usually some uh, crossover. The writer's room is the brain trust of a TV show. The people who can come up with those stories, those characters and write them and write them well, quickly, it's too much work for one person. One person cannot do that work. As a showrunner, I'm the leader, but I, I am, but I have, I'll, I have people helping me. So on Queen Sugar, we do anywhere from 10 to 16 episodes a season. We have a fairly small writer's room. So our writer's room, including me, is usually six people. Okay. So you can see why these jobs are hard to get. That's six people who are responsible for coming up with ideas and writing scripts and outlines and and then hopefully producing their episodes as well, meaning being on set sometimes while the show is shooting and uh, doing what we call protecting the script because directors and TV um, job in and they job out, um, unlike film. And so you have to be, when you're working with different people coming in, you're making one show, but you might have 10 different directors for 10 different episodes. You gotta allow those directors to do their creative work and elevate your show but you have to be delivering the same show. That's where being a TV writer and producer and showrunner becomes very important so that you don't have someone come in and turn your show into, you know, a third wave French experimental film. Right. Um, we got to no. stick, stick with the style guy. We got to stick with <laughs> the style like, guy. And suddenly like, what is this show? I thought it was watching a show called Queen Sugar and now it looks like something else, you know? So, so consistency is important. So the, the writer's room is literally a room generally speaking, or now a Zoom room, where we basically go into a room, shut the door for eight to 12 hours a day. And so that job becomes very, it's about your talent and your work ethic, but it also becomes, uh, it's a bit of a social job too, which is kind of a weird um, skill set for writers who tend to be people who want to be left alone. <laughs> TV is different. You got to be able to be left alone and go into a room and write and hit your deadlines, but you also got to be able to sit around a conference table with people for eight to 10 to 12 to 14 hours a day, just shooting ideas back and forth. And out of that creative chaos, it's my job to extract the best of that, organize it and make it a TV show. So a TV mm. show literally starts off Every TV show starts off with a blank wall, mm. an absolute blank wall. And you got to be able to go into that room, look at a white blank wall and mm. go, I see a TV show. <laughs> That's the job. I love that. That's, <laughs> That's so the job. Great. And it is both a great process and it can also be hell on earth if you have the wrong people doing it. There you go. That's right. Exactly. I can <laughs> only imagine. <laughs> you can get out of a bad dinner party. Um, but I think that that's wonderful. And to sort of express that process to, you know, as you get into that writer's room and then you sort of see that through all the way, right? So right. talking with your DPs and setting the style and the tone for the way exactly. the show looks and, and how you keep that consistent across the, the season and, you know, talking with all of your heads of department. So it, um, you know, I'm curious for you, like, what is your favorite part of the job? What do you like? To my do favorite part of the job? Um, my favorite part of the job is, is the writer's room. I mean, the writer's room is the heartbeat of a television show. And it is where the images that we eventually see are first dreamed up. Yeah. It is, you know, you know, what's more fun than being in a room with a bunch of smart, creative people who are all committed, hopefully, to making this one thing. Yeah. And like I said, if you have the wrong people doing it, it could be hell on earth. But if you have the right people doing it, it is lightning in a bottle. Yeah. And most shows, believe it or not, live and die by what's happening in their writer's room. 
Oh, yes, absolutely. And, and so, you know, think of production, TV production as having a stool with three legs, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. um, and those legs are the writer's room, the cast, and your crew. Okay. Mm -hmm. And they all got to be operating in a type of synergy. But the crew and the cast cannot do their best work if that writer's room is not on and popping in a way yeah. that it needs to yep. be. Right. It, it just, it just, and that's how TV operates. Well, that's where it all begins. Yeah. I mean, literally the job of creative executives at studios and networks, like a major part of their job is to put to get, help the showrunner put together the writer's room yeah. because they know if they get that wrong, <laughs> it, they, they, they ain't going nowhere. It ain't, yes. it ain't really happening. No, I, <laughs> you that's know. amazing. Queen and I know Sugar had a lightning in a bottle writer's room in its first season. Yes, absolutely. And that was it felt. really, really did. And, you know, because none of us had ever seen a show about sugarcane farmers before. Yeah. And you know what? <laughs> exactly. And I think and I know we have to hop to questions now, but that kind of leads right. me to my my last question before we go to questions is, um, you know, I personally, like I said to you, I'm a big fan of the show and I love the show. And I think part of it is because of what you said. It's a world that we haven't seen. It's mm. so deeply immersive. I love the location. I feel like I'm there. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that yeah. makes a big difference. That house, mm. those backdrops, like it's mm -hmm. just it pulls you in. Yeah. And the characters that you feel, they're just unapologetically black in a way that Absolutely. we don't get to see on other shows, right? Absolutely. We're not getting a, a white gaze or a, a male gaze or a this. It, what, it feels like it's authentically sort mm -hmm. of from a place where mm -hmm. we're getting to see, um, you know, the creativity of, of the writers that you put together and the directors. And I'm curious, uh, for me, are there any characters that you love to write or that you felt like were politically really important to the landscape that you're like, I love that I'm getting to put this this character out into the world? Or Absolutely. was it all of them? I mean, I, 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 am in, I literally am in love with these characters. I have been almost since day one. Um, I would have to say um, Ava DuVernay created a character that I think we haven't, seen on TV before and causes a lot of very strong reactions, this character. I love this character. I love the actress who, who brings this character to life and informs her and elevates her. And that's the character of Nova. Mm. Um, I don't think that this is a very unapologetic character. Yes. Um, when you talk about unapologetic blackness, that is truly one of my goals mm. in entering into television was to be able to participate in that. And this is where uh, Ava's background and start as an independent filmmaker became a real plus uh, mm. because she didn't necessarily accept how things had been done before. Mm. And in this regard, it was a real advantage for us. And I immediately recognized when I met Ava what she was doing and I sort of creatively just kind of like we kind of interlocked on that mm. and I was like yes this I can do this I can pour myself into um, because you can't as a black tv writer always pour yourself into the shows that you get yeah. a job on because sometimes it simply isn't wanted in the past I think mm. there's a conversation happening now where things are starting to shift but I, I, I like to describe it as I've been on shows in the past where I felt like I could only really write with one hand because mm. they didn't really want all that I had. They didn't mm -hmm, want to mm -hmm. like, they they too, wanted, they didn't get too much in there. Right? You know, you know <laughs> right. and, I, and I had people at one point tell me that I was too black and, and, and calm it down. <laughs> that is absolutely, you froze you know? up for a second, but that's horrifying. That's just, I don't even know what that mm -hmm. means. Well, I'm still in the business and they are not. So, you know. There you go. Not. There you go. Let's add to that. Um, you know. No, it's true. I think, and, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll hop over to the questions, but I agree. Yeah. I think Nova's such an incredible, strong character. And she, yeah. and there's so much that. I also want to shout out Ralph Angel as a character. Yes. I love because, Ralph Angel. Oh, and I, I love this character and I love, and he makes me think of, of, of certain men in my family. Uh, some of my brothers, this character. Um, and, uh, because there are, there's a, he's so, he has a kind of like old school, what you might think of as Southern, but really exists everywhere. 
can mm-hmm. kind of dip into toxic masculinity sometimes. Yeah. You know, yet he has the yet he has the sensitivity to him. He's in touch with his feelings. He's a real human being. Yes. Multidimensional for a black man. Mm. And Kofi Sirabo, who plays him, just embodies this character and breathes life into this character in such an incredible way. Um, I love writing for all of our cast. I love, I, I mean, if I start naming names, I'll forget. Yeah, well, I love Hollywood and Vi. I love to see a relationship. Yeah. I love a relationship that's like, you know what? Not all of these relationships have to be troubled. And right, and right. this, there is a love here and we can focus on the joy and the fact exactly. that like this man loves this woman. And exactly. we're not following to tropes and stereotypes of what we think about men and what we, you know, it's like, it's exactly. just, it's real love. And I, I love that relationship. Thank you for calling that out. Our show, rightfully so, um, gets acknowledged for a lot of the groundbreaking hiring that it does in terms of women directors. Um, um, but you could also do a whole, um, and in terms of the imagery of how we present Black people and Black women in particular, um, I do think there can be more conversation on our show about what we're doing with Black men. Oh, on our yes. Show. Um, Absolutely. what we've done in the writer's room on our show in terms of the diversity of uh, that space. In terms of me being a showrunner, there are very few Black male showrunners. There are yeah. very few Black showrunners, period. Very few Black male showrunners. Very few Black male showrunners in drama. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I carry that banner proudly. Um, yeah. And hopefully one day it won't be so unusual. You know? Yeah. I love that. Thank you so much. I could go on and on, but I want to make sure we get to some questions because we have a lot of those young people who will hopefully be yes. changing, changing that. So we're going to start. Um, Joseph Gonzalez will be our first question. Hi, Joseph. Hi, Anthony. Hello, Rashim. It's nice to hear you talk about the whole process in terms of just creating shows and just really um, inspiring for someone like me. Okay. Um, and my question today is actually about just... <clears throat> getting your pilot script out there. What advice do you have yeah. for young and new screenwriters to kind of get their pilot script seen and potentially produce? Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. Because for me, I actually, last semester, I wrote a half hour comedy script called Eagle Rock uh-huh. and it stars a Filipino American girl, which I cool. feel like I haven't seen on television. And cool. I like to c- describe it as like a mixture of, Nora from Queens meets The Graduate because you have this young girl that comes home from a liberal arts school in Michigan Uh and is trying to figure out how to like navigate the rest of her life post graduation in Los Angeles. Okay, in the neighborhood of Eagle Rock. Uh, Yes. Oh, beautiful. I used to uh, teach at Occidental College. Oh my God. It's so hard to find (laughs) people know Eagle Rock. It's amazing. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. I love that. I love show about it. So, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Oh my God. Um, So, um, I want to, I want to say a couple of things and, and I have to, I have to, I used to, I, I get this question a, a lot and I used to have, I used to answer it in a certain way and I've had to force myself to answer it in a different way because I have to acknowledge where we are now. I used to say to this question to people who are starting out or getting ready to enter into TV that you're trying to put the cart before the horse by trying to produce your pilot before you've had a career in television writing on other people's shows. Um, I'm gonna pull that answer back 50%. It's still 50% true, but we are in a moment where the need for content, another term I heard, I hate it as a creative (laughs) person, but that is what it is, um, is so great that the traditional doors are starting to open up sooner to young talented, writers such as yourself who have a vision to see something that they have not seen before. So I would encourage you to think about how to get your work out there on two tracks. Okay. Mm -hmm. Don't think about it just in terms of here's my script. Who's going to do my show. Do think about it in that way, because what that says is that you are cultivating your own voice, your own vision and TV thrives on people who have their own voice and vision. And it also likes young people (laughs) (laughs) because Mm -hmm. it wants to stay hip and current. And so do think about that. But Joseph, I really want to tell you, you're probably going to get further in the beginning on using that script 
to get you representation as an agent or, or manager, quality agent or manager, mm -hmm. in terms of you being able to get a job on someone else's show, okay? And build a career as a staff writer. So the positions in TV writing are, first of all, in a writer's office, there's the writer's PA, you know, production assistant, there's the writer's assistant, there is the script coordinator, uh, there's the showrunner's assistant. Mm -hmm. Those are four jobs that exist. They are all hard to get. If you can get one, grab it wow. and kill that job mm. kill it with a smile it mm. is a job i'm going to tell you right now for most college graduates that will feel beneath you you're getting coffee you're making copies you're doing this but what you're really being paid in also is an access and yeah. in the opportunity to build your network because this is a people business as yeah. well okay and um those jobs pay too little that is not right at all. And there's a movement called hashtag pay up Hollywood to address that. And hopefully that will be addressed. But so if you can get one of those entry level jobs, great. Um, do that. But then in terms of writing, there's staff writer, story editor, executive story editor, co-producer, producer, supervising producer, co-executive producer, executive producer slash showrunner. Okay. That's the latter, right? Wow. <laughs> okay. Uh -huh. So when I'm somebody, when someone like me who's been doing this for close to 20 years hears from someone new, I want to be a showrunner. In some ways, you're saying, I want to skip over all of that and just yes. be the boss. Mm -hmm. And occasionally it happens, actually. But like <laughs> it's a very I actually think it's a very dangerous thing when that happens, because mm -hmm. uh, if that person doesn't hit their <laughs> career is over before it even got started. But what can but. What can happen is, is that you having a voice in a script and having the ability to actually write your own pilot and it's good, it's great, that can open doors for you to become a staff writer. You might be able to skip over all the assistant jobs, maybe, you know. Um, so what happens is, is once you get those jobs and you do well in those jobs writing on other people's shows, you begin to meet network executives and studio executives and agents and managers. And you and then the, your fellow writers. Remember, anytime you're in a writer's room and you're working with a writer or a producer, that writer or producer knows 100 other writers and producers. OK, so if you're in a room with 10 writers, you're really in a room with a th with with a thousand. In terms of your network. Which will make you act right and do your That's job right. with a smile. Actually, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> okay. It's like so when you get mad that somebody's like, just remember, if you want to piss off that writer, they got a hundred writers behind them, and they will call <laughs> and ask about you when you go out for your next job. So you mm -hmm. can either help yourself when you get that job by doing your job with a smile. Don't be abused. No reason for that, but do the job with a smile. Because remember, you're building a network. So use the script you have for two things. Yes, try and get your script into the right hands of people who can go, you know what? I want to mentor you into creating this show. Yes. yes. But also use it to try and get a job somewhere on that rung and then get that job and you show up with a smile every day and you kill that job and your career will grow. Because you want to be more than a one trick pony at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. because let's say you do get that show on, like you just shoot right to the top. They pair, chances are they'll pair you with somebody like me, you know, yes. <laughs> to, because, <laughs> because why? And why is that? Because a TV show and a TV writer's room looks like, and a TV set and a, or a pilot to a TV show, it looks like a script. What it is, is a business plan to employ 300 people and to convince a studio and network to give you $50 million, mm -hmm. which is what it's going to take to produce a TV show, generally speaking. Okay. Somewhere between 40 and $75 million. A TV show is really a pop-up corporation. Okay. The showrunner and, you know, in my case, the showrunner and the creator are in charge of that corporation. So why would a studio and a network give a beginning writer $50 million and say, come back with a TV show. They're not. And when people, and when you start to think about it that way, <laughs> it makes yeah. sense. No, why, why, would, why would they? Now what they will do is go, 
we value your voice. You got something and we're in the hit making business, but you know what? Let us find someone to help you along the way. Mm-hmm. And that's where we have these sort of creative marriages, right? Yes. Because, and also a pilot is one script and it could be great. But what about the second script and the third script? Yes. And by and the, the way, and the second season and the second season and <laughs> maybe the third season. OK. And by the way, you got eight days to write it and shoot it. So so you when you t- when you take all that on, you begin to understand rightfully or wrongfully why the business operates the way it does. It needs you. We need you. I, you know, the business needs you and everyone like you to write those scripts and have those ideas and want to break down barriers. You know, I very much consider myself, even though I've been doing this for almost 20 years, to be very much at the beginning of my career. I just signed my first overall deal in the last All uh, right. Snaps. six months, wow. you know, but it took me 18, 19 seasons of television to get to the point where they're going to pay me a black man just to come up with ideas, which means I won, right? Cheers to that. <laughs> Bring up that coffee, Anthony. I like it. Um, that was wonderful. Right. Thank you. And that was and, and, and extremely informative and yeah. appreciate you bringing all of the, the, the knowledge and your personal experiences to that. Um, right. I want to throw it to our next question. We have Alejandra. Hi, everybody. Um, Thank you guys so much for hosting this. This is incredible. And just like, Anthony, hearing your story and where you started is so comforting and validating because I started, so I decided to go back to school because I was really unhappy in my last career. And I kind of realized like that I always loved entertainment and film, but I never saw somebody like myself outside of being like an actress or a model or a singer, like though, and and I'm none of those things. So I was like, this just isn't for me. Like this industry, I can never work in the industry. Um, Mm. I was really unhappy. And um, I think with time, I really understood like how impactful media can be, you know? Absolutely. It was Michaela Cole's show, Chewing Them, that made me want to go back to school because it was- Great show, great show. Seeing my- self on screen like my struggles were literally my struggles coming from a first generation Caribbean family like Mm -hmm. although she was black although she was from the UK like that didn't matter right Uh, at the core we have the same struggle so I decided to go back to school um I never thought I was a creative person this semester I'm taking screenwriting and actually I'm doing really well I'm like surprised but I guess all those years (laughs) content really paid off you know Um, right and the hours in front of the TV really did something. Right. Uh, but my question is, um, when you're creating something and there's a message there, how do you make sure that your message stays whole and intact as it goes through the production process? Because I know <laughs> things get yeah. changed and shifted yeah. and you create this wonderful message and that you want to spread, but sometimes it doesn't really go according to plan. So how do right. you... Right navigate that well that is the the quintessential question for almost all collaborative creative uh uh uh, ventures and make no mistake television is a collaborative creative venture it is not the i'm just gonna you know i'm not gonna tell you necessarily what you want to hear but i'm gonna tell you the truth it is not necessarily the space where if you want to write what you want to write and you don't want to have anybody say anything and that you want to just take it and shoot it exactly what it is you need to write novels and you probably need to self-publish them okay (laughs) because even in the publishing industry you have editors (laughs) um so that is the challenge of tv and that is the joy of tv And what you want to do is hopefully have producers that believe in the vision that you have. You want to have studios that believe that, hear the vision you have, understand it, grounded in character. You know, um, messages in TV need to come from character. Um, um, And uh, that gives it a greater chance of making it through the process because we're all in TV, we're all watching to become invested in these characters. You know, people people talk about on social media, they talk about Queen Sugar like Ralph Angel's in the next room. They talk about Charlie like she is like, you know, she's hashtag goals to them. You know, they want to be a badass like Charlie. Yeah. And, and so because they're invested in these characters, then your message, you know, can sort of get out. So I think what you want to do is, you want to know what your core 
message is, what your core vision is. That's the thing that you protect. That's the thing that you make sure stays intact. You know, if I started out doing a show and I wanted to be about a black girl on the South side of Chicago, and that's the core of the show, some of the other stuff I might have to give and take on, right? But when they say, we love your show, but we now want it to be about a white girl uh, who lives on the north side of Milwaukee, you know what, now that's a different show. And that's not what I want to be doing. And that's a gross example of it, but, you know, it has happened, <laughs> you know. So you, you want to know what your hills to die on are. Yeah, you know, what what do you what are you going to go to bat for? Because look, yeah. there's always you have to pick and choose your fight. Exactly, that is to say yeah. that you know there's there's always going to be something. So figuring out like what are the deal breakers and what are the things that are great to have. Because um, remember, when you're entering into TV, it's the studio's money. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. It's their money, and so and that's sort of the trade off that you make if you want access to that mass media space. And the rewards that come with that in success, financially, in terms of influence, in terms of pop culture, potentially, all those things, the trade-off is they get to have a say. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, thank you. And thank you for that great question, Andra. We have Mateo Flores up next. Hi, Mateo. Hi, um, my name is Mateo Flores. Um, I'm a recent writing for film, TV, and emerging media graduate from Ithaca College. Well, congratulations. Um, thank you. Um, so my question is, you kind of answered it a bit in the first question and during your talk, but um, my question is, since like most entry level positions don't really offer like college students or most recent graduates um, the means to production, how yeah. do we like, sort of, especially like I'm when I'm asking this question, I'm thinking specifically Gen Z, like we're growing up in this like very odd, strange time. Yeah. Um, how do we get our stories to be seen and told, right? Because like, I think we all understand like sort of the writing aspect of it. Um, but how do you recommend we get our stories like out there, I guess is my question. So I want to be, I want to be sure I'm understanding your question in terms of like television. Are you talking about how do I, you know, yeah, I, I mean like scripts and stuff too, because I think a script is great and then it could be like very well written, but it's not like a book, you know, or like a short story, you know, like a script is something to be produced. Right. Um, so how do we sort of get it in that spot where it's getting read to like either be produced or be something of more substantive okay. value? Yeah. So there are two things I want to say um, to your question. I, and one is process oriented and one is product oriented. Um, you heard me talk earlier about how I was doing plays and one man shows and stuff like that 20 years ago. If I were you today, I don't know that I would do that unless I really just, you know, love theater. I'd probably grab this thing here yep. and go shoot something. It's a different now, world. You, because you're growing up in it, 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 you may not know this, but you all have the most accessible like you can put your work out there. You only know who Issa Rae is right now because she created a web series called Awkward Black Girl. Got her friends together, wrote it, produced it, put it on the web. It took off. She was able to take advantage of that as an entry point into the more traditional media of television and film. And now you know who Issa Rae is and God bless her for doing that. So it really is, so it's process oriented in the sense that you have to do this work. You're right, scripts don't read like books and people want to, and, 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 and this is where you have fun and also build your resume and get your work out there. So there really is no skipping over all of that. Uh, my creative partner and the creative of, of, of Queen Sugar, Ava DuVernay, we only know Ava's name because Ava, you know, you know, about 15 years ago decided, you know what, I'm going to do something else in addition to my successful public pub, uh, publicist career. And she picked up a camera and she, you know, took her money. As I heard her say once, instead of buying a house, she bought a career and she made a film. 
you have to put yourself on the line at some point. There really is no shortcut. And this is one of the things I sort of hate about our instant gratification society is it gives people the idea that they go to college, get a degree, and now where's my career? It's not like that. It is a longer process. So your goal is to get a job as close to somewhere in the space of media, film, TV, streaming that you think you might be interested in. Get that job, hold that job, do well in that job. And also because you're young, make the time to do your own creative work, writing, producing, directing, whatever that is. Festivals, okay, some tangibles. If you're going to be a filmmaker, there's the festival circuit. I don't know, you know, it's making your film, putting out there to the best festivals that you can find, seeing if there are people who are going to respond to that, okay? That opens up doors that you potentially don't even know exist. The one thing you have to do is do your work and you got to put your work out there. You can't control how it's going to be received, but you, nobody can react to it if they don't know it's there. And no one can know it's there if you're not doing it. So it's about building a career. And that is a long-term venture. Um, that's a very, that's a long-term venture. You want a career. You don't want a moment. I feel sorry for people who actually kind of blast out of the gate because they can yeah. have a moment, but they don't have any skill sets to sustain that moment at all. And, yeah. And, and it can and, dangerous place actually. Yeah, and to your earlier point, it's like you can only you only get that level of um sort of one big time. And so if it doesn't go well, really you don't have that that foundation, that infrastructure to to rest back on, to continue on. Um, thank you for that, Anthony. And yeah. I think we've got uh one last question. We've got Miss Kendall Ivy. Welcome. Hi, Kendall. Hello, thank you guys for having me. Um, my name is Kendall and I'm currently a junior at North Carolina a and State University, majoring in journalism, mass communication with a concentration in mass media production. Beautiful. Um, thank Great. you. So um, I, my question is for the both of you all. I am I'm very interested in production and I'm trying to get as much you know, experience as I can in assisting and just being present in those spaces. Um, and as for somebody who's not a writer, I haven't really, I took a script writing class in school, but I haven't really tried my hand at it. And I have ideas. Would you recommend somebody like me trying to find writers who would be interested and want to pick up the idea to write or just, you know, me trying it for myself first? Like, do you have any advice to that? Well, I would encourage you to go in the direction of your passion. I mean, honestly, listening to you, you sound like you might be a producer. Um, but you haven't really given yourself totally over to trying to write, but you know, we're, we're people writers, you know, we, you know, we are, we're kind of cut from a particular kind of cloth and you, you know, I would suggest that you be, a explore your writing more to see if it really is for you. But I would also encourage you to know that you might be the person who knows a good story when they hear one and see one. You might be the person who finds great satisfaction from bringing elements together to have a story get out there and be realized. You might be a, you might be a creative producer. You might be a line producer, which has a lot of creativity in it, but a line producer is the person who is physically in charge of the production of a film or a TV show and physically figures out, you know, where to spend money here and where to spend money there. And they are um, uh, equally valuable to TV and film projects. There is a space for you in uh, TV and television that does not have to be a writer space. So I would encourage you to, 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 to but your exploration of writing um, is only gonna help you be a better producer, you know, you may discover that you are a writer and that is what you want to do. You may discover you're a writer slash producer, which is what I am in TV. Or you may discover I'm a producer and I can see that if we take this script, this great story and put that actor together with this director 
And, and then I'm going to be the person who somehow pulls these elements and go find the money in order for it. You might be that person. God knows we need great producers, <laughs> you know, because we look artsy first. I mean, I'm a producer too, but I'm a producer from a creative space. I just want to go and stare at a blank wall and create, you know, a TV show, you know, and then I want to hand it to somebody and be like, can you help make that happen? Cause I'm going to go, go create another TV show. <laughs> you know? um, we all, you gotta know your lane, you know, <laughs> and yep. you are in a space of the good news is, is you're young enough to figure out exactly what that lane is. So keep going in that direction. And the piece that really connects with you, listen to that inside yourself. You know what it is. Thank you all so much. Thank, thank you, you Kendall. Kendall. And thank you, everybody. This was wonderful. Uh, Anthony, I mean, I can't thank you enough. I think that the knowledge that you've shared with all of us in the audience is so incredibly valuable and we're so grateful to you and just can't wait to watch season five of the show and season Please six do. of the show. Please Congratulations. Do. Thank and, you so you know, much. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure. And uh, anytime, thank you for having me. Wonderful. Thanks, everybody. Okay. <laughs>